good afternoon. So, um, there's been a lot of interest, uh, if you follow the news, in medical cannabis for a whole range of conditions. But one of the conditions that uh, is approved uh, for treatment with medical cannabis is Parkinson's disease. Many of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease and symptoms that are similar to what happens in Parkinson's disease. So I thought I'd just give a brief overview of cannabis, what um, cannabinoids, which are the materials that are found in the cannabis plant that is known by its slang name as marijuana. Marijuana, of course, has negative connotations. It's what Mexicans use and uh, that the DEA went after the the precursors of the DEA, which was uh, Harry Anslinger and the Bureau of Dangerous and Narcotic Drugs, when alcohol prohibition was repealed, the whole army of enforcers would have been unemployed at the beginning of the Depression. There are a lot of, you remember all the stories about going after Al Capone, the bootleggers, and so there are a lot of enforcers of alcohol prohibition that would have lost their jobs if they didn't go after another bugaboo of society. So they decided to go after marijuana, which is the name that the Mexican workers use for the plant that they've been using traditionally for a long time. Uh, so it, 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 it was, there was a big propaganda effort beginning in the 30s uh, that made marijuana seem like the killer weed, the demon weed. And if you used marijuana, that meant, even now Jeff Sessions says, people who use marijuana are bad people, still have that concept. So it was a big, big change to finally recognize that this plant has a lot of medicinal properties that has been known for thousands of years. And the reason that I got really interested in it is it turns out that we make our own marijuana, quote unquote, we make our own cannabis in the brain and we have cannabis receptors. We call it the CB1 receptor. That's why this drug that comes from the plant, tetrahydrocannabinol, interacts with the receptors that we naturally have in the brain to produce a range of effects. And it's the same reason that we react to opiates. We make our own opiate drug in our brain called endorphins and kephalins. And they interact with endorphin and kephalin receptors. And that's why drugs from the poppy plant, opium, morphine, etc., react with those receptors in the brain and produce psychological effects, pain, relief, etc. So whenever you have a, a plant in nature that produces molecules, that recognize receptors in the human brain, we have then a new drug. We have a, a drug that can be developed for medical properties. And it was the presence of the endogenous cannabinoid system is a relatively new finding. It was found in the 70s that we are making our own endorphin. Actually, the receptor, I'm sorry, making our own cannabis-like drug, our own uh, uh, cannabinoid receptors were discovered really late and then the presence of compounds that interact with that receptor produced in the brain were, were more recent. So we have a whole rationale uh, and, and, and a platform for understanding how the materials from the plant interact with brain receptors produced biological effects. Some of them are very desirable effects, and I'm going to talk about that. Desirable in the sense of having medical properties. So I'm going to stand here to see better. So the cannabinoids are, it's the name for, the generic name for all of the cannabis-derived molecules that are very special. There are at least 60 related molecules. We call them the phytocannabinoids or the plant cannabinoids. Uh, they contain no nitrogen, which is an unusual. Most of the drugs that we use and most of the molecules that we make have not only carbon and oxygen, but they have nitrogen. But these compounds have no nitrogen at all, which is a curiosity of nature. What do these molecules do for the plant itself? Well, some people think it's, it's to protect against insects. So they do, you know, the molecules that are fragrant, uh, that plants make either attract insects, 
for the purpose of pollination or repel insects for protective purposes. Um, so that's what a lot of people think. But it turns out that some of the plant cannabinoids are involved in normal development of the plant and sexual reproduction of the plant, a sexual development. We forget that plants are sexual beings. Uh, uh, be, I don't know if you want to call them beings, but you know. <laughs> but anyway, there's <coughs> pollen and the ovaries, and they, they get together, and then you have a new plant. So. <coughs> So what is the history of this in terms of uh, medical use? Well, 1700 BC, not many of us are around then, but luckily we have great records. Uh, it was described in the Egyptian papyri. In 900 AD, um, this uh, Arabic physician, Al-Kindi, described its use for muscle spasms. 900 AD, 900 years after Christ was born. In 1800s, that's when Western Europe finally learned about cannabis. And it was a British physician named O'Shaughnessy who was with the British troops in India and noticed that the, they used very commonly preparations, various preparations, sometimes in a liquid form, sometimes smoke, sometimes as a capsule, sometimes as a tincture extracted into alcohol for medical purposes. They used it to uh, for tetanus, which is a lethal disorder. In tetanus, all the muscles get very rigid, and if you use cannabis, he noticed that they could survive because it relaxed the muscles and they could breathe. Uh, they could... Uh, <coughs> so antispasmodics and anti-tremor agents. So O'Shaughnessy, when he came back to the UK, brought a gallon of tincture of cannabis indica and began to talk about it to his fellow physicians and it became a standard therapy so that by 1880 this, the handbook of neurology written by William Gowers which was like the, the most well-known neurologist in England at the time has several pages on the use of called Squires extract or tincture of cannabis indica um, indica meaning it came from India, but there is also sativa, which is found in other parts of the world. Two major strains of cannabis. What's more important than the strain is the content of the different cannabinoids, varies. And there's variations that all of the breeders in California and Colorado are coming up with new variations with various proportions of not just the cannabinoids, but also what are called the terpenes. And the terpenes are the molecules that give it that flavor. There's limonene, there's uh, Pinene, the, the, the aroma that, that is unique to the plant is due to these other molecules that more and more we're learning have medicinal properties too. And one of the important things at the end I'm going to talk to you about is called the entourage effect, which goes contrary to what we know about <coughs> modern pharmacology, where we think of one pure drug, one receptor, a spectrum of biological effects. Now we know you can have several drugs interacting with multiple receptors produce biological effects and sometimes it's better to have an entourage effect. I, I'm going to get to, to mention it now but later on we'll review it again how it applies to other drugs like antimalarial drugs. Uh, so there's a return to our I guess roots, but no pun intended, to start looking at combinations of phytocannabinoids to treat various conditions as opposed to just one pure THC molecule which is, let me get into that. Okay, here's, here's, here's what it looked like. And here's what Gower says, I was already got it. This is what uh, was sold at, at the chemist shop, the uh, apothecary. That's the, the terms that were used for the pharmacies in those days, the pharmacists. And he describes, in one case, tremor had commenced in the right arm and leg an hour after a railway accident and extended three months later into the left arm. Two years subsequently, there was a constant lateral movement at the wrists and joints, but no tremor of the fingers. So many times, and James Parkinson actually believed, as many of his um, other physicians said, Parkinson's disease could be caused by local trauma, and then it would spread. And there's no evidence for that. but. He's reflecting the original concepts of what caused Parkinson's disease as a post-traumatic reaction. Uh, but in any case, he noted great improvement occurred on Indian hemp 
And a year later, the tremor had almost ceased, being occasional only. So this is one of the examples. He has several pages in his book uh, on this. It's important to point out that hemp is ubiquitous. It has very low levels of tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the psychoactive component of the cannabis indica. And the hemp is grown primarily for its fiber content. And George Washington, Thomas, they all were hemp farmers because that hemp was used to make rope for sailing vessels, for sails, for all kinds of things. So hemp has always been a kind of a major agricultural product in, in Europe. And, and it's a, it's a re related plant. Uh, and a lot of this, one of the components that you can find in the hemp, but it's present in very low amounts, is CBD or cannabidiol. We'll talk a bit about it in a moment. So I mentioned that our brain is loaded with receptors for cannabis, <coughs> cannabinoid receptors, and they're heavily distributed in the deep gray structures of the brain. Those of you who have heard me talk realize and understand that the pathology in Parkinson's is in the deep gray structures of the brain. We think of gray and white matter. The white matter are fast conducting fibers that are insulated. That's why they have white fatty material. And the gray matter are neuronal populations, brain cells that really carry information and astrocytes that are supportive cells. So the outer mantle is gray matter. Then there's all the white matter that connects to and from the deep gray structures of the brain. We call the basal ganglia. Uh, and the cannabinoid receptor uh, can be localized and visualized using a technique called autoradiography where you have a radio labeled cannabinoid that binds to the receptor and then you sacrifice, this is done in animals, you sacrifice animal, you put a photographic emulsion over that brain section and you can see where that drug is localized, where the receptors are, so to speak. Um, and nowadays, we can do the same thing in living people with PET scanning, where you use a radio labeled cannabinoid, injected intravenously, wait a month, certain amount of time, then do the PET scan, and you can see the distribution of the cannabinoid receptor. The reason that's so important to scientists is that it gives us a greater understanding of why and how the mechanisms of action of plant cannabinoids, because it's interacting with certain neural systems, some of which we understand quite well and some of which we don't understand. We certainly understand the neural systems responsible for automatic movement, those are the ones that are affected in Parkinson's disease. And we know those neural systems are loaded with cannabis receptors. <laughs> so the highest density uh, uh, of uh, receptors is found in the output uh, ganglia, the output nuclei. So the substantia nigra, you've all heard of me speak about it. That's where dopamine neurons reside. And those nerve fibers from the dopaminergic neurons are loaded with cannabinoid receptors. So you can imagine if you take a cannabinoid, interacts with the cannabinoid receptor, it's going to have an effect on movement. That's the number one thing. And you have an abnormal movement, maybe, maybe it'll improve the movement. Or could it make it worse? We'll see. But clearly, you know it's going to make it better because otherwise it wouldn't have developed over millennia as an anti-muscle spasm agent that it will improve. You get rid of the spasm, you can move better. The spasm often develops, like the rigidity in Parkinson's disease, because of the deficiency of neural transmission, neural networks that mediate movement. And so you end up with a lot of tight muscles and no movement. In the rat brain, now this is, the, the, this is actually the kind of work I did as a PhD graduate student. I worked with one of the pioneers in autoradiography named Lloyd Roth. And this is an example of, is it my work? But I did similar work with the opiate receptors because when I did my PhD work in 1970 to 75, that was the heyday of the discovery of the endogenous opiates. So I did the same study. I used tritiated morphine, injected it into a mouse, sacrificed a mouse, cut very thin sections, put a photographic emulsion, developed the emulsion. And this is a result from CB1. CB1 is a cannabinoid receptor. And Here's the substantia nigra. See how the more black 
the greater the cannabinoid receptor. Cerebellum, which is very much as coordinated movement, is loaded with it. The cerebral cortex is loaded with it. Hippocampus, the site responsible for memory, formation of new memories and eradication of old memories. You know, it's very important that we forget. If you didn't forget, you become what's what happens in post-traumatic stress disorder. There's some things that are so powerfully recorded in your memory that anything associated with that emotional response will bring up that memory and make you panic and become fearful. So, so anyway, the, the hippocampus is loaded with it. And the emotional brain, called the limbic brain, is also loaded with cannabinoid receptors. So it's, it's found in the endogenous cannabinoid system is found throughout the brain. And what I point out that I don't really talk much about it today is that it's distributed in the immune system as well. But it's a different kind of receptor. It's called CB2. So the white blood cells that mediate the immune response are also responsive to cannabinoids. And that's one of the really interesting <coughs> beneficial properties of cannabis, that it's an immune modulating agent. So it can decrease inflammation. That's why it's so useful for arthritis. So it's an anti-inflammatory drug, as well as a drug that has a whole bunch of effects on the central nervous system. In the human brain, how we look at it is PET scan, and the greater the amount of red, here's the scale, the more, the, the heavier the density of receptors. So here's the cerebral cortex from the side. Here's the MRI. Look at the whole cerebral cortex is loaded with CB1 receptor. The basal ganglia, these deep gray structures, are, here's the caudate. That receives all the dopamine terminals. It's loaded with, with uh, cannabinoid receptor. You can sometimes see it better. Uh, here also, this is putamen. <laughs> receives dopamine neuron innervation. So, so in the human brain, you can see widespread distribution of the cannabis receptor uh, in brain, but in particular, it seems to be very heavily distributed in the deep gray structures of the main brain responsible for automatic execution of movement. So the fascinating thing for me, because I study age-dependent neurodegenerative diseases, and the classic one is Parkinson's disease, but the other disease, movement disorder, is also age-dependent. When I say age-dependent is, it increases in likelihood the older you get. So most people end up developing Parkinson's disease in their 60s or 70s, so it can happen younger. So it's an age-dependent disorder. And what's fascinating is that the brain, the number of CB receptors is decreased. The number of them in the motor areas, especially the striatal efferent neurons. Um, so and it occurs in parallel to the generation of these neurons during normal senescence. Now, with normal aging, we lose neurons, and we also lose cannabis receptors as we get older. Uh, the changes are really complex because different parts of the brain age at different rates. So the part of the brain that ages quicker are these uh, deep gray structures of the brain, the dopamine system. So you know there's a diminishment of the CB receptor in those areas earlier than other areas. And the other interesting thing is that I've only mentioned the CB1 receptor, but there's a whole system involved. There are the enzymes responsible for synthesizing the endogenous cannabinoid. It's known as, by the way, anandamide. Anandamide is a Sanskrit or Indian word meaning the joy molecule. That's what uh, Meshulam from Israel is the one who discovered anandamide, and he named it. But there's another one that's made. So you need enzymes, you need machinery to make the drug, the, uh, the endogenous. We call it a neuromodulator, because it's not a true neurotransmitter like dopamine, but its function is to modulate neurotransmitters. So if you have overactive dopamine system, the anandamide is elaborated by its biosynthetic uh, uh, machinery, and dampens and kind of modulates downwards the dopamine activity. So in Tourette's syndrome, where people have 
overactive dopamine system. They have multiple motor tics, and I don't know if you know about this, but they'll say, blah, 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 grunt and yell, and, and you treat it by giving anti-dopamine drugs that you don't give to Parkinson's disease because it would worsen Parkinson's. But the phytocannabinoids are remarkably effective for controlling Tourette's syndrome without producing Parkinson's because the problem in treating Tourette's syndrome with anti-dopamine drugs, which are the major tranquilizers, is that can make them too slow and rigid. So this is one of the uses that is given an example of how a neuromodulator would work. In the case of Parkinson's disease, you don't have enough dopamine. So what does the cannabinoid system do? It's turn it up a bit. It modulates the activity. So if there's underactivity of a neurotransmitter, the, the cannabinoid system is there to regulate upwards. So it's, it's one of these um, homeostatic systems that keeps things fairly stable. That's the, the <clears throat> what so much of the research that's going on is not so much with giving it as a medicine, but there's a, every day there's hundreds of papers coming out as to how the cannabinoids work in the brain uh, at a molecular and cellular level. And that's why I'm working on some basic research on this, how the traumatic brain injury uh, involves changes in the endocannabinoid system and by manipulating then the cannabinoid system with cannabis, you can enhance recovery from traumatic brain injury. That's an example of one of the projects I'm working on in, in mice, not in humans. What's also fascinating is that the changes in the cannabinoid one receptor density is different in men and women. Uh, if you look at, on, the, on this is the age, so 20 years, 30 years to 80 years, increasing age. This is the density of the cannabinoid receptors. And you see that the, uh, let's see, the CB1 receptor, I'm, I'm blocking out, which are the women? The women are this line and this, this line. Let me see, left brain area. I forget the significance of this. But in any case, the rate of change of the CB1 receptor uh, differs in men and women. There's a certain point where it's kind of overlaps. It's a regression. It's the entorhinal cortex for men. Dash line, okay. It's, it's much more than you need to know. Um, and, and this is more than you need to know. Just showing that in the healthy brain, this is a healthy neuron. Uh, I'm sorry, microglia. So this is an immune cell of the brain, a microglia. This is a neuron. And the neurons this have CB1 receptors, that's what the squiggly line is, in the cell body. And it makes endocannabinoids, which this neuron, where, uh, which is anandamide. The microglial cell has a CB2 receptor. Microglia is the immune cell. So, so its immune function is regulated by a different receptor. Uh, with disease brain, the, the microglia the immune system is activated. In Parkinson's disease, we have an overactivity of the brain's immune response. It causes some of the problems, the inflammatory changes that drive the disease forward and the resultant demise of neurons. And they end up having an increase in the CB2 receptor. Uh, the neuron itself in, disease, in, in the disease brain has a decrease in the endocannabinoid production and a decrease in CB1 uh, receptor. CB1 is in neuron, CB2 is in um, the immune brain. So, so they go in different directions. The CB2 receptor increases with disease and with aging, and CB1 receptor decreases with disease and with aging. And the T cell, which is a circulating cell with CB2, will also change in disease. So we'll just focus on the bottom. This summarizes everything. So this is quite fascinating. So people who have Parkinson's disease have a prodrome well before they develop slowness of movement, rigidity, and tremor. They already have some changes in the CB1 receptor. So you can see here in the pre-symptomatic stage of Parkinson's disease, the CB1 receptor is down-regulated. But once you develop the illness, 
the CB1 receptor goes up and the CB2 receptor goes up. Um, so the CB2 receptor goes up in the reactive microglia, in other words, an activated immune system. And the increase in CB1 is an adaptive response um, to the decrease in CB1. So as the illness advances, it's trying to compensate for the diminished CB1 receptor by upregulating the CB1 receptor. So one of the ideas is, what if we gave a CB1 receptor antagonist? Would that be beneficial? Because we not only have cannabinoid agonists that act just like the anandamide, the endogenous one, just like the exogenous one, THC, but we have now synthetic drugs that can block CB1 or CB2. And I'm not gonna to spend too much about that, but that's what the pharmaceutical companies are hoping to get in on. Unfortunately, there are very, very negative effects of using pure drugs that block CB1 receptors. They're great for research, but there were some studies being done where people got very, very ill using synthetic antagonists of the cannabinoid system. It's such a critical system that if you start mucking around by blocking certain receptors, you can get in trouble. Well, I don't have to tell you about Parkinson's disease other than to summarize the pathology is it's Lewy bodies accumulate in neurons. These Lewy bodies accumulate in the brainstem and when they accumulate in the cerebral cortex, you have the mantua Lewy bodies, which is the second part of the talk. I'll spend 10 minutes on that after we're done with the cannabis talk and, and you can ask questions about cannabis. Um, and what happens in Parkinson's disease this nigrostriatal system, this is the substantia nigra, which is loaded, by the way, with cannabis receptors, projects their fibers, the caudate putamen, these deep gray structures in the brain. In Parkinson's disease, you see it depigmented, you lose the projections, and you have a much less dopamine being released in the caudate putamen, and a result of that is slow, monotonous speech, rigidity and tremor, reduced arm swing, shuffling gait, etc. You're all familiar with the clinical phenotype. So there have been a, the, the sad part of this part of the talk is that there are not that many well-controlled, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies that the FDA requires for any drug to be approved for a specific treatment. There are some, um, but they haven't gotten FDA approval because it's not a single drug. and They don't ever go give you approval for combinations of, of uh, like what you get in the plant. So they've already approved synthetic THC since 1985. It's used for nausea, vomiting, and uh, glaucoma. It's pure THC. Why don't we just prescribe THC? And in fact, I've tried that, and it's so impossible to control the effect because it's so slowly absorbed in oral form. And because it's a pure, single THC, it doesn't work as well as if you give it with CBD or an entourage of other cannabinoids. And that's where I'm bringing up the entourage effect, that pure molecules from the plant, like C THC or pure CBD, are not as effective as when they're given in combination. But you are all familiar with combination drugs. Levodopa was intolerable by most people because it made people throw up. But if you added carbidopa to levodopa, that's known as cinnamon, that's our standard drug. Same with, with the cannabinoids. If you get your pure THC or pure CBD, you're not gonna get the same benefit as you give various proportions of THC to CBD. The ideal is a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and I have a study that talks a bit about it. So, by the way, the state of Florida, the rules do not allow officially the smoking of the, of the weed, of the plant. Um, it can be vaporized, which is a lot healthier, so that's fine. Um, there are different ways to vaporize the plant, uh, and many of the dispensaries will, should, will, will provide vaporizers for sale, you know, so you don't have to go to a, a head shop like the underground people go to get all these different devices for uh, delivery. So and this, this is an open label study, just observation with 22 patients. Uh, they smoked the cannabis, and it improved both motor and non-motor features of PD. And the way that you score motor improvement is by using a rating scale called Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. There was statistically significant improvement in the motor function by smoking cannabis. Um, if they looked at specific motor symptoms, there was significant improvement in tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia. 
What I find quite fascinating, and there's some really better studies that have been done, this is considered a weak study because it's open label, there's no control group. So it just gives you an idea, hey, it might be useful. This kind of data is important because it leads to more carefully controlled studies. So they found significant improvement in sleep and pain scores with no clinically significant adverse effects. Important thing to remember, no one has ever died of a cannabis overdose. You fall asleep if you overdose. Or you get very, very anxious. That is probably the worst effect. And some of that has to do with how we metabolize the phytocannabinoids. It's, it, and one of the programs that we'll be doing at USF is looking at the genetic variations in the metabolism of cannabis. So we can do that and design a personalized medicine for the right cannabinoid. That's downstream. It's not available right yet. So in this one, one of the difficult challenges we have every day is controlling the levodopa-induced dyskinesias. Now, as you know, 50% of the patients will develop levodopa-induced involuntary movements that can be quite incapacitating and troublesome, maybe even as bad as the disease itself. And usually that necessitates deep brain stimulation. So in this case, by the way, nabilone is synthetic. Uh, uh, THC. It's made in the laboratory and they give very low doses or placebo followed by levodopa and it reduced the dyskinesias from marked to moderate uh, without any increase in Parkinsonian disability. So it shows that a pure synthetic THC like drug is effective in reducing dyskinesia. It wasn't a dramatic effect. I've had patients who've gone to Colorado and they get their E-pens, I've interviewed them, and they say as soon as they have a dyskinesis coming, they will take uh, a few puffs of the E-pen and they can attenuate the dyskinesia. It gives me a lot of hope that I can save people from deep brain stimulation, um, save them from surgery if they have their E-pens that they can use uh, to prevent the dyskinesias. And the nice thing, it's easy to prevent dyskinesias, just stop the levodopa, but then they're off, they're rigid and they're slow. But this, you could give it without worsening the Parkinsonism. And they talk about how it worked. I'm not gonna get into that. <clears throat> what I find quite fascinating and important, as you all know, there are all these non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease that are just as troubling as the motor symptoms. The insomnia, the depression, the apathy, pain, night sweats, all this stuff. So in this series, uh, they had six cases of PD patients with PD-associated psychosis for at least six months, and they were treated with CBD. Now, CBD is that part of the plant that has no psychoactive effect, they thought. But it turns out it has some mild anti-anxiety effects. But CBD is known for its antioxidative and neuroprotective effects. So they gave a trial of CBD for four weeks along with their other medicines. They were started on 150 milligram of CBD tablets and increased, and they got the average dose at four weeks was 400 milligrams daily. The psychotic symptoms, by the way, you're all familiar that, with the fact that one out of four patients on levodopa who has Parkinson's disease will develop a psychosis. Paranoia, delusions, visual hallucinations. It's, it's quite dramatic, and I tend to use novel neuroleptics like Seroquel. But if I had this, this has a lot less adverse effects and may be neuroprotective. With Seroquel, I always have a black box warning. Be careful about using the elderly. It can result in a prolongation of the Q interval of the EKG, and it's overused in nursing homes, and there's increased mortality in use of these drugs. That's what, every time we use Seroquel, I have that scare, scary thought. Now, maybe this is not such a good drug. But I use it in such low doses, I feel very safe. I've never had anybody with adverse effects. But once I can prescribe or the patient can get on CBD, we might uh, improve this dramatically. So there was a decrease in the psychotic score under CBD treatment. It didn't worsen motor function. And, and it decreased the total score. So it actually improved some of the motor features as well of Parkinson's disease. 
And this is really important. You all know about this REM behavior disorder, the insomnia with acting out dreams and kicking into sleep and sometimes fighting with your pet partner. This happens very frequently in Parkinson's disease. How do we treat it? Well, I give Seroquel, which has a lot of risk. Unlike, Seroquel can kill people. Most of the drugs we use that are in psychiatry can kill people. It's a matter of dose, what other drugs they're taking, etc. You can't kill people with CBD. No, it's, it's kind of an amazing literature that there is no lethality associated with really big doses. Generally, when you go to a clinical trial, you have to do uh, determine the LD50 in three species of animals. In the mouse, uh, a, a rabbit, maybe a dog. I think that now it's only two species. And you keep on increasing the dose in populations of animals, and you look at the dose that kills 50% of the animals. That's called the LD50. And you look at the dose that produces improvement in 50% of the patients. That's called the therapeutic uh, index. And when the LD50 is very close to the therapeutic index, that's a dangerous drug. Well, there is no LD50 for any of the cannabinoids. So, just to emphasize that there's no adverse effects. The biggest adverse effect of using cannabis is with the police. <laughs> it's true, with Jeff Sessions' uh, uh, attitude that we're gonna get you because you're immoral. There's no good people that use cannabis. There's no reason we should allow cannabis in the United States. It's very un-American. This is what a lot of people say, but if you look in, in rural areas, they all grow in their own weed and using it. So there's a lot of hypocrisy there. Well, anyway, I'll summarize it here. There's a, more work. Um, there are some really good studies that have just come out in the last year. I, I thought I had that as the last slide, using what's called Sativex. Sativex is the only FDA, well it's not FDA approved, approved by Canada Health, approved in 20 European countries, and it's still not approved in the US, but it probably will be. Sativex is an extract of plants that have known amounts of THC and CBD plus the other terpenes. And it's delivered in an oral mucosal spray, like a breath mint, and it's flavored with peppermint. And it's been approved for, and used in Canada Health, in Canada, for multiple sclerosis, pain that's refractory to opioid treatment, for tremor, for Parkinson's. So it's used in Canada that way, and in Europe. In the US, they're still not along with. But Sativex was used in a study in Spain in Parkinson's disease, where they took one-to-one -one ratio, it had like 2.5 milligrams of THC, 2.5 of the CBD, sprayed three or four times a week, and they found improvement in the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale that was significant. And this is a double-blind placebo control because you can make a placebo easily by not having the active cannabinoid, just having the flavor, the mint, and the other terp terpenes. So that was pretty impressive. So that preparation of one-to-one -one ratio is what many of the growers and dispensers will have available. So eventually, um, people will be able to use a vape pen to s administer under the, con you know, the advice of the recommending physician uh, cannabis to treat nighttime problems, insomnia, REM behavior, sleep disorder, anxiety, to treat slowness, rigidity, and tremor, and to treat dyskinesias. Basically, it's a fantastic drug for Parkinson's disease. But as I was mentioning to Larry, Nothing works as good for Parkinson's disease, slowness and rigidity as levodopa. So I would still use that drug. But as soon as I see a patient that has Parkinson's disease, I'd probably suggest they use CBD every night, 100 or 200 milligrams a night, because there's another element that I didn't show up in this slide because I didn't download the most recent version, is that the US government is a bit schizophrenic. I shouldn't say that because I really like this country. but. The FDA, DEA, say there's no medical use for cannabis. It's a drug that could be abused. It's a gateway drug. We've got to keep our citizens away from it. It's ranked along with heroin, LSD, as Schedule One. But NIH, the research arm of the uh, United States, and I'm supported by NIH, 
two of the uh, their researchers, intramural researchers, one named Julius Axelrod, who won a Nobel Prize for his research on neurotransmission, uh, found that CBD and a number of the cannabinoids are neuroprotective. They're, they protect against excitotoxicity, oxidative stress. And they have received a patent. The NIH has a patent on the use of CBD and related cannabinoids as neuroprotective agents. That's what I'd hope to show you, the, the patent. So one branch of government has a patent on the use of a cannabinoid, which is Schedule One controlled. It doesn't make any sense, does it? I think to really enhance research, they have to remove cannabis and all of the, because the plant is on Schedule One. And all of the components of the plant are considered to be Schedule One. And if it wasn't for the states that have legalized medical cannabis, we wouldn't be able to get as far as we are now. So it's, it's uh, eventually, I believe, I don't think under the present administration we're going to see that. Uh, removal of cannabis from Schedule 1. So uh, I think I'll end here just to say that I'm optimistic about novel approaches to the treatment of Parkinson's disease and related disorders that will, that I like to look at it this way, it's going to be a complementary therapy. It's not going to be the mainstay of therapy. But the good news is, let's say there's a major disaster. The pharmaceutical companies fail. There's a major war, nuclear disaster. Cannabis, if it's still growing and not contaminated, will be able to treat your illness. It's fantastic. If we had nothing else, I'd feel very comfortable in managing Parkinson's disease with the plant and other plants. So uh, there's an area of pharmacology that's no longer taught that I love best. That's why I became a pharmacist, was the history of drug development always begins with the plant. So I've always been interested in botanical medicine. Um, my wife also, for example, she found the plantain plant, which is a weed, it was used by Native Americans for insect bites, mosquito bites, and so she made an extract of this plant in coconut oil, and she's a beekeeper now, and she gets stuck with bees, she puts that on, it's amazing how quickly she recovers from a bee sting. So that's an example of a botanical medicine that most people have forgotten, the Native Americans knew about it. We've forgotten all of these things because it's kind of, uh, we look down on primitive medicine. And there's so much that people forget. That's how we made our advances. But all the drugs that we have now, for example, digoxin for congestive heart failure. What well, was the foxglove pen known in England for since the 1700s that was given in, a, in an extract for people with dropsy. Dropsy meaning congestive heart failure, shortness of breath, swelling of the ankles. They gave foxglove extracts. From the foxglove, in the beginning of the 20th century, they identified digoxin, which is a mainstay treatment for cardiac illness. Same thing with uh, apomorphine, what we use for, it's a dopamine agonist to, for rescue. You give it, inject it into the skin, and it quickly acts on the dopamine system. Well, believe it or not, apomorphine was first derived from the opium plant, acid extracts of opium. Opium has a whole bunch of alkaloids, one of which is morphine, diacetyl morphine, etc. But apomorphine is not a painkiller, it's a dopaminergic agonist, and all dopaminergic agonists make you nauseous, but it improves motor function. Well, Gower's book talked about three different plant-derived medicines for Parkinson's. One is the acid extracts of opium, which is apomorphine. So he described a dopamine agonist before we knew anything about dopamine in the 19th century. It was from a plant. He used belladonna alkaloids, which you get out of the angel trumpet leaves, and, and very toxic. But they would make extracts of uh, belladonna alkaloids for the tremor of Parkinson's disease. And the third was cannabis. So I think, and, and now we will come up with some very fascinating new approaches for brain disorders and for normal healthy aging. So one of the fascinating, I've given this talk and maybe uh, for, uh, I'm involved in teaching physicians about how to use cannabis. I help write the course for physicians. I give lectures uh, around the country on the use of cannabis and talk about this, this, this thing. Um, what's I think very important is going to be 
the re-education of the medical community. It's starting at medical school level. And of course, the population has to be educated. We have to let them know this is not a dangerous substance. Now, I don't encourage teenagers to go out and get stoned. I don't want them to get drunk either. And I don't think anyone should. It should be regulated like alcohol is regulated. And I think eventually there will be a recreational aspect to cannabis. But the medical use of cannabis it should be more stringently controlled because we're making products that have to be very pure. The extraction process has to be well defined. But I think if you're gonna use cannabis recreationally, just like you'd want your wine and vodka not to be contaminated, the same thing has to go true for recreational cannabis. But I think in some states they've already done it. And what's interesting is that the states that have allowed recreational cannabis have a decrease in opiate overdose deaths. Um, and there isn't an increase in drug abuse in the countries, in the states that have uh, recreational cannabis. But that get, becomes a whole other political issue. I'm, I'm lukewarm about recreational cannabis, but I'm very much uh, interested in developing cannabis as a medical uh, treatment for movement disorders. So I'll, I'll take some questions. Uh, how does cannabis affect cognition? That's an ex excellent question. Um, the studies that have been done in the early days were concerned about interference with short-term memory. And indeed, you can become forgetful. That's what, you know, is a, I don't know if you've seen Cheech and Chong movies, but space cases, if you're, but it's a dose-dependent phenomenon. And I think if you use it all day long, that's called abuse. I mean, I would consider that to be abuse. You're gonna become absent-minded. You may have short-term memory problems. On the other hand, but it doesn't affect judgment or anticipation, driving, etc. Um, as far as I know. I mean, you're already cognitively impaired, and you have FTD. Okay. So, could you take that? I don't know, but I think probably there's. I didn't talk about other conditions like Alzheimer's. There's evidence that it it prevents the formation of amyloid and it may be beneficial in Alzheimer's disease. In the case of frontal temporal dementia, also known as PICS, they accumulate abnormal proteins and it may prevent that from happening. So it may be, have beneficial effects. How it um, affects thinking, I'll tell you what it will do. It'll give you a sense of well-being and who doesn't want to feel a little better about their existence? Um, this, th because I don't call it euphoria. Oh, euphoria means a false sense of well-being, and that's what psychiatrists use. But one of the, the benefits of cannabis that improves a lot of non-motor symptoms and improves sleep, it relaxes people, they're less anxious, and they're in the moment. This is the thing that happens. That's why so many artists like to use it. You get in the moment. Musicians like it because they get into the moment and they play beautifully and they pay attention. So there's a lot of benefits to thinking uh, and for creativity. Uh, what it does to, even, even in psychosis, there's studies of people with psychosis and Parkinson's. Now people who have psychotic reactions and Parkinson's have a dementia, and yet they take cannabidiol and they get better. So, so I'm not too concerned about negative impacts on cognition. I'm concerned about excessive use making people very forgetful, and they could get disoriented. And this, this is a true phenomenon. On the other hand, that Enhancement of forgetfulness can be useful in the hands of a therapist in treating post-traumatic stress disorder. There's some big studies going on right now with the VA population using cannabis at the VA to treat PTSD. And so, and that, it relies on the fact that you can dissociate connections, you can forget certain things if it's done properly. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Any clinical trials first? There, I'm, I have designed the clinical trial, and we're waiting for the funding um, for Huntington's disease. Uh, but we are planning clinical trials in Parkinson's disease. Uh, and you would hear about it, because I'd announce it here, that it would be done at USF. But eventually, we could maybe do clinical trials here. It doesn't have to be done at a university. So we'll, you, we'll let you know. 
Uh, do you recommend that anyone with Parkinson's go to see their physician to see if he would uh, prescribe? Most physicians are not, have not taken the course. Most physicians know nothing about the endocannabinoid system. I wouldn't go to your physician okay. unless your physician happens to be one who took the course. It used to be eight hour course, now that, because doctors feel they're too busy, they reduce it to two hours. Yeah, but what you need to find, and you go to the Department of Health website for the list of physicians who are certified to recommend and see if your physician's there. If not, you find one that's nearby. Um, I would love to have physicians, I have one physician who understands Parkinson's disease that when my patients say, I would like to try cannabis for this or that, do you think it would work? I said, well, what I know it probably worked, but I can't recommend it. The reason is I have to, I should have made the disclosure. Um, not only am I a researcher in this field, but I'm also the medical director for one of the growers. I helped prepare the application two years ago. And it wasn't given until just a month ago. They challenged it. And so now, because I'm a medical director for a grower uh, of cannabis, I can't recommend it. Though I'd be the best one to recommend it. But there's a conflict of interest. So there will be other physicians that I know that I refer patients to. Um, the, the nearest one I know right now is in um, Apollo Beach. But eventually, there will be many, many more physicians. I think there's... I forget the number, but the number is increasing. But most physicians won't, they don't want to be bothered because it's complex. You, it's not so easy as writing a prescription for oxycodone, right? It's not so easy, I could write a prescription for Marinol, which is a synthetic cannabis, but it wouldn't work very well. There has to be a massive education of the physicians and healthcare providers on this new endogenous cannabinoid system. And that's what we're doing at the university. I've given, I have the lectures to the medical students, to the graduate students, and this College of Pharmacy is forming a botanical medicine research and educational consortium. It's multidisciplinary. And we're going to, our goal is to not just educate the academic community, but also practicing physicians and have an outreach to patients uh, so they understand what's going on. Yeah. Well, if, if your neurologist is specializing in Parkinson's, wouldn't that be a person who could prescribe that? Or not necessarily? The person who is your neurologist, who is an expert in Parkinson's, he's made no diddly squat about cannabis, unless he took the course, unless he was interested in it. So that physician would need to register with the state, take a two-hour course, then he's licensed. Okay. And then you would, let's say you go to him or her. If he diagnoses that you have a condition that's listed under the state regulations as treatable, he can then register you with the state. You would get your medical cannabis card, and then he would write the recommendation you take that recommendation and your card to a dispensary. Now every grower has going to have 25 dispensaries. Right now there's the number of dispensaries is limited because this is brand new. But there's 12 growers, each will have 25 dispensaries and they're distributed throughout the country. I think there is a dispensary in Sarasota. I know in Tampa there's a handful already. Uh, I know that the Three Boys Farm that I'm working with will have dispensaries in Sarasota as well. So I think uh, I'll take one last question. I won't be able to talk about dementia, which is fine. What I would like to do is not talk about questions, talk about the results. You are the kind of doctor that would like to see more. I make a connection. I make a connection. I study one thing and another and put it in the media. So it's not I go about creativity. Thank you. Well, the thing, the thing is, uh, uh, Frank is a friend, not just a patient, so he's, 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 he's being flattering. Uh, but, but the thing is, I, I'm a bit of an oddball as a physician. Oh, I, I know you're not leaving because of me. No, I, but, uh, but I have to tell you, I had three different careers that I've integrated. I started off as, a, as, a, as an artist. I actually was a professional artist and, and an illustrator until I was 24 years old. And I realized, this is no way to make a living. Uh, I didn't, 
it was difficult. And I have too much pride to ask my family for money. My father was a physician who was disappointed I wasn't doing what he wanted me to do. So I, I tried it until I was 24. And finally, you know, the next best thing to do is to go be a student again. The reason I liked being an artist was that I had a lot of choices, I thought, except the one choice that you have is how am I going to pay the rent? I mean, so I had to get a regular <laughs> job. So there was not much freedom in being an artist. So I gave that up, partially. And I went back to university because so many choices. I could become a, a psychopharmacologist, I could become an architect. I decided to become a psychopharmacologist, got a PhD in neuropharmacology. And then I, I did two years of research. And by the age of 31, I said, this is, I can't do this for long. It's so boring working with mice. And so, you know, and so I was encouraged to do a PhD MD program. I went to medical school. And then in medical school, of course, I was very interested in the brain and, and because I was a neuropharmacologist. So I ended up becoming a neurologist. And since I love being a student, that's why I'm a professor. A professor is a professional student. We're paid for studying things. So I have a salary just for being curious, for pursuing new lines of research. So that's what I've done. So I focus that in movement disorders, neuropharmacology, molecular biology. And the beauty of it is that having an artist background where I did a, a, a it, it's very useful for neuroanatomy, neurofunctional neuroanatomy. So Briggs says is a bit correct. I see things from three different perspectives. Most physicians, high school, college, pre-med, medical school, work their butt off to pay off the debts, and one patient after another so they can afford their yacht and their second home and pay off their debt. They're not into learning new things. Most physicians are not into expanding their brain and learning new things. So, I, I'm sorry I have to insult my colleagues that way. Not all of them, but many of the community-based physicians are that way. So, that's why I always re recommend, if you're not happy with your current private neurologist, get seek an opinion by an from an academic neurologist. There's a number of really good places you can go to for that other opinion, besides my university. University of Florida is great, University of Miami. Those three places have experts in movement disorders that I would seek an opinion from. In the Mayo Clinic as well, in Jacksonville, and in, yeah, in Cleveland Clinic. So we have a lot of good medical centers in Florida. I'm the one with FTG. My I asked my neurologist about the cannabis. Don't call it dope. Dope is what we use for Parkinson's. <laughs> Dihydroxyphenylalanine is dopa, L-dopa. Anyway, that's absolutely yeah. yes. There are many people that think that way. Well, it's a challenge. It's, it, it would require them to study again. <laughs> and, you know, people don't like to have to take tests anymore. You know, we're grown up taking test after test. Now, for me to be able to recommend the medication, I have to go take a course. But they don't like it. I don't need a course to write painkillers. <laughs> anyway, so that's it. We'll end here. Uh, another time we'll talk about dementia of the body. Thank you. Yeah.